Take your copy of God's Word this morning, open it up to Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, and beginning in verse 14. We live in what is known as the theological term, inaugurated eschatology. It's a big word, two words, help you out a lot on the Scrabble board, but basically what it means is Jesus has already come. He has redeemed us from sin. But we are waiting him to finally come and make all things new and everything wrong with this world he is going to one day make right. Well, within this passage of scripture of Matthew chapter 9, we see something a little bit different taking place. Jesus has come for the first time to earth, and some of the disciples of John and the Pharisees are still operating under an old covenant mindset. And Jesus says, a new covenant I bring unto you. And they ask him a question about fasting abstaining from food for the purpose of mourning and desiring God. This is how he responds, beginning in verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved." The disciples of John the Baptist who have been preaching the kingdom of God for repentance of sin come to this feast that has been prepared, probably the same feast that Matthew the tax collector who had heard the words of Jesus, follow me, and had turned around and done that and invited his friends to, the tax collectors and the sinners. Jesus had just said, I come not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And now in the middle of all that, the disciples of John begin to look around and they say, why are you not fasting? We fast. Even the Pharisees fast, but you do not fast. Why is that? Jesus gives an interesting response. He says, as long as the bridegroom and the bride are present, there is no need to fast. But when the bride and the bridegroom are gone, that is when the time of mourning takes place. I don't know about you, but I have participated in a lot of weddings. I've officiated several of them, but I've actually been in more wedding parties than I've officiated. So I've had some experience with being a part of a wedding. I remember being eight years old and getting in a limousine in Louisville, Kentucky and driving, not myself, but being driven to the star of Louisville, the boat, my cousin getting married and trying to keep up as the ring bearer with my other cousin who was sprinting down the aisle. It was a real challenge. I can remember being given the responsibility a few years later of making sure that the groom's car was properly decorated for the trip to the honeymoon. Some of you can read between the lines and what that means. Maybe you've experienced it yourself. You have a lot of joy at being a part of a wedding. But there was one wedding I want to tell you that I had no joy whatsoever in being a part of. And that was the wedding of my friend Mark Ayers. Here's why. I wanted to make sure that everything went off in that wedding without a hitch. So I came up two days before the wedding. I was trying to make sure everything was set in place. The day of the wedding, people kept calling him on his wedding day. And I eventually took away the phone and said, stop asking about when we're going to eat. and Stop asking about what time you're going to get here. He needs to focus on other things. When the photographers came to take pictures, it was 90 something degrees outside. And I didn't want him in the sun longer than he had to be because I was afraid he would sweat through his tuxedo. I mean, I had all of these concerns. And finally, when the wedding actually began to take place and the ceremony started, there were a couple of people who got mixed up in line and the, and the minister didn't come in when he was going to. And everybody else seemed like they were enjoying this wedding they were they were laughing through it and I wanted to look at them and yell out people this is not a joyous celebration this is a wedding and Jesus looks at me and the disciples of John and the Pharisees and he says why are you not rejoicing Why are you not celebrating? 
The bridegroom who you have longed for is here and you don't get it. John the Baptist even says himself in John 3, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom and the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. And this image here is all throughout the Old Testament that God will redeem his bride, the church. And now it's taking place. And rather than rejoicing, they're fasting. Now Jesus isn't against fasting. He fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. He said in Matthew 6, not if you fast, but when you fast. He isn't against fasting. But fasting for the wrong purpose and at the wrong time. And the time to fast is not at the wedding feast. Listen, Israel had good reason to mourn and to fast. They had experienced warfare. They had experienced famine. They had been exiled from their own country. They had good reason to mourn. But now, the promise through Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed is here. This covenant-keeping God who refused to break his promise with them, even when they broke their promise with him has redeemed his people. It's almost like they've got this script right in front of them and they come to the line where they're supposed to applaud and they just totally miss it. I wonder sometimes when God looks down at us and he's working in a thousand different ways and in many different people and when we fail to rejoice at what he does among us, I wonder if he does not look down from heaven and say, why are you not rejoicing? Why are you not celebrating? You have the spirit of God within you and you are acting like you're miserable. It's not the witness that we want to give to the world. I like what one person re reminds us of here that when we come together as the people of God, there's a sense in which God comes as one who gives us common sense. Listen to what Joy Davidman says in her book, Smoke on the Mountain. Unfortunately, man cannot for long endure the common sense of God. Side by side with Christianity and often mistaken for it, there has always existed a dark Eastern religion of despair. The religion of despair often achieves a nobility, very impressive to those who are impressed by dramatic gestures, yet it is the very opposite of the true gospel. The Christian gives up his own desire for the love of others. But this Eastern religion renounces the world because he thinks himself too good for it. Pride over love. It's the devil's best trick. So much so that Jesus says in Matthew 11, to what shall I compare this generation? They are like children who said, we played the flute for you, but you did not dance. We played a dirge for you, but you did not mourn. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in challenging times. We live in a society that's getting more strange by the minute. But if we don't take the gospel and rejoice with what we have, we do the world a disservice. Whoever the president of the United States will be, whatever this country will become, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, is seated on his throne. And we'd best not forget that. And we'd better not get so caught up in the cares and toils of the world that we forget to sense the glory of the living God. Do you see how he's working? I can't walk into this room without thinking it's a miracle that we're even here. I do the same thing when I go over to Crossroads. I was doing a membership interview with a sweet lady Wednesday night hearing her testimony and just thought, how in the world are we here? But it goes beyond buildings. I see this in some of your lives. Some of you were told a couple of years ago that you didn't know whether you'd be here today. Some of you have been through awful, awful family breakups. Some of you have lost your jobs. But then I see how you've responded. I see how you've honored the Lord. I see how you're trying to be husbands loving your wives and fathers and mothers loving your children. I see you adopting and doing foster care. I see you trying to reach out and love your neighbors. And I'm just humble that God is at work. Brothers and sisters, may we never lose our all that 
God is with us and that anything he is doing is worth celebrating. Well, he moves on from there. He goes from this text where the bridegroom is with them to suddenly this bridegroom is missing. And the wedding guests begin to find out about it. Everybody's there. They're all gathered as a couple except for the two that matter most. And the reason that they are missing is that they have been taken away. And when the wedding guests realize that they have been taken away, they begin to, instead of mourn or rejoice, they begin to mourn. And the bread tastes stale and the wine tastes bitter. And they no longer desire to eat because the bridegroom is no longer with them. And instead of being seated at the right hand of the place of honor, he is hung between two thieves. And the reason that they mourn is because they are the ones who put him there. I received a phone call this last week from a dear couple um, back in LaRue County. Husband has been called into to hospice care. He's got Parkinson's disease, pretty well advanced with it. It was a unique situation. They weren't coming to church at Mount Tabor at the time that I came, and they started coming shortly afterwards, and he couldn't hardly get here on given Sundays just depending on what his health was for that day. But he would always send in a tithe, and every time I would come, he would always give an encouraging word, he and his wife. They were just so encouraging. And the reason I knew that they tithe is because sometimes they accidentally sent the check to my house. And so I would, I would open it up and there would be an offering to the church and I would take it to the treasurer, of course, but that, that's how I knew it was all that was in there. It would come to me instead of to them. They tried to call me this week. Hospice has been called in. Spoke to him. He told me he loved and appreciated our relationship. Prayed for him. Got on the phone with his dear wife. Prayed for her. She broke down. We have a unique thing that we do in churches. We don't do it as much anymore, but we used to do it quite a bit. We had meals after funerals. Many of you have been a part of that. But you know what I've noticed for the one who is close to the loved one? A lot of times they don't have a desire to eat. They don't have a desire to eat, drink. Because the loved one has been taken away from them. Oh, when we realize that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. When we realize the price that Jesus paid, we will mourn, the Scripture tells us. That's exactly what it's like to live in a world without the rule and reign of God. It's the mother with child running for her life in the demonic dragon. It's the cry of the herald that mighty Babylon has fallen. It's Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more, because the glory of the Lord has left the temple and the Spirit of God. is nowhere to be found. That's the time to mourn. And then he says, the reason that you need to understand when to rejoice and when to mourn is through a couple of illustrations. And he tells us that the latter part of this chapter. Look at verses 16 and 17 together. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. He says, look, because this patch is being placed on an old garment, instead of mending that garment, it causes it to tear. Jesus is basically saying, why would you do that? You know that the old garment is worn out and a new patch is going to expose it. And he looks at these disciples of John and Pharisees and he says, you have so focused on your religion, your Judaism, that you have lost out on your relationship with Almighty God. He's not disparaging the law. Jesus says, I came not to destroy it, but to fulfill it. But what he is going against is anything beyond the gospel. All the rituals that we add to it. So much that in Matthew 15, he will say, why do you forsake the commandments of God for your traditions? Oh, how much we struggle with that today. He might say to us, why do you so fear change? Or why do you so desire not losing control that you miss the very purpose for why you're here in the first place? Or if you're on the other end of that, and you don't like that, 
why are you so looking at failing man that you have forgotten to worship and obey the failing God? <laughs> he says, you know better than that. And then he says something else. This new wine is being placed into old wineskins, and instead of filling the wineskin, it causes it to burst. In the Old Testament and early New Testament days, a wineskin was an animal skin. And so if you tried to put new, new wine into an old wineskin, it would become brittle and it would burst. You had to put new wine into a new wineskin so that it could be malleable. And, and Jesus looks at them and, and he declares to them that there is a day coming when you will not need to confess to a priest. You will not need to offer animal sacrifices. You will not need to put a new patch on an old garment. You will not need to put new wine in old wineskins because it won't fit. And if you are trying to live in anything outside of the atoning work of Christ, you are no different. So you say to yourself, if God really loved me, he would give me a relationship. As if a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is somehow not enough for you. You say, if God really cared for me, how could he use someone like me after what I've done? You need to look at the book he wrote and the people that he used. You say, why would God place me where I am in this life? Surely I could have done better if I'd just been placed somewhere else. As if he didn't know exactly what he was doing when he formed and fashioned and placed you. And you keep telling yourself these lies and you keep asking yourself these questions and somehow unless the whole world lines up with your stars, then you don't believe that God is doing what he told you to do. But what you need to do is stop telling yourself these lies and start asking yourself this question. Why are you trying to put the gospel of Jesus Christ into your old box? It won't fit. And you try to hold on to the old life and to the way and the life that you thought you had for yourself and you're trying to stuff it with everything. Some of you are expert packages and you get through airport security and you're trying to stuff all these things in and the zipper is flying open and you can't take all of this stuff because it's overweight. That's what you do when you put anything that you expect in life and you don't get it beyond the gospel. That's what he's saying to them. Listen. Christ has freed you. He has loved you with an everlasting love and he has called you unto himself. And instead of wondering why God put you where he put you today, maybe you ought to start wondering at the amazing thought that God included you in his plan before you even knew who he was. Some people say, why doesn't God save everybody? Listen, I look at my life, I'm amazed that God saves anybody. And when you truly respond, not out of pride, but out of humility, you'll see the same thing. This pre-offer of the gospel is here, but it doesn't come with a new patch on an old garment. It doesn't come with new wine in old wineskins. It doesn't fit. And some of you, the reason why you're miserable today is you're trying to put your relationship with God with everything else that you expect in this life. But what God has for you is better than what you could ever have for yourself. I read of a story just recently of what happened between the border of Germany and Czechoslovakia. Most of us were alive during the Cold War, at least we know about it. It wasn't a war fought by weapons or by blood, but fought by technology, fought by ideology. Well, between East and West Berlin, there is a wall that came down. But there's also borders between countries that were not allowed to be crossed. And between Germany and Czechoslovakia, there was a border running the entire gamut between those two countries. That border was taken down, and researchers noticed something about the red deer. Here's what happened. When they took the border down, they expected the red deer would cross on either side because deers don't know about, deer don't know about borders. You know what they found? 
that over the, the, the course of that time, when that fence was dismantled in 1989, no deer in Germany ever crossed to Czechoslovakia, no deer in Czechoslovakia ever crossed to Germany. They must have not had passports. They, they trained one deer in particular. They put a GPS on her collar. Her name was Ahornia, which I think is a unique name because especially a female deer doesn't have an antler or horns, but this was her name. She's particularly noteworthy because she was born 18 years after the wall was destroyed. And yet, over the course of her life, she never crossed into that other side. We're talking just feet. She, she never went into there. And here was the thing, that land that's formerly occupied by the fence and the land beyond the fence had become a haven. It was a nature preserve, much better than the land that she had had before. It was her perfect home, and yet she would not enter. And researchers concluded that perhaps tradition had been passed down to her, from her ancestors, that no matter how much the land appealed, she would not enter in because her traditions held her back. Brothers and sisters, you can grow up in church. You can serve. You can do many things for God. But if you're more focused on knowing about God than knowing God, you're missing the whole point. If you're serving in every other capacity, but you're not in the Word of God, you're not in prayer, you're not in discipleship with other believers, God is calling you to a relationship with Himself. And some of you are stuck so much in your traditions. You're stuck so much in the way that you think church ought to be run or in the way things that ought to go that there is a land of rest for you that the Bible describes in Hebrews, but you won't enter in. There is a place of joy a place of peace, and you think, well, I have to give up all of these old things. I have to give up the old garment. I've got to put away the old wineskin. And what you don't realize is that if you give them up, you would gladly do so if you knew what waited for you on the other side. And so he calls to you today. This land that is wide open, this new wineskin, this new garment, but the only way that you enter into that land is a reckless abandonment of yourself and a relentless pursuit of the will of God. So that when the bridegroom comes for you, Jesus Christ himself, to receive his bride, that you would not be found waiting, that you would not be like the five virgins who were left and the man asked them, why were you not watchful? Why were you not expecting? But instead, when you see the bridegroom and hear his voice and you're called to the eternal supper of the Lamb, that you would not be found mourning, but rejoicing. Because you realize that the Lamb of God is seated on his throne and he ever lives to make intercession for you. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon video today. If you found it helpful, would you consider sharing it with a family member or a friend? That would help us to spread this ministry and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also find more information on our website, berryefields.com. Again, thanks for watching.